Hey everybody, it's Chris with Xano, and today I'm going to talk to you about security functions and filters. We're going to be introducing you to different methods on how you can encrypt and decrypt data inside Xano. First, I'll go over a couple of different use cases where you might find this useful. I'll show you where the functions and filters are inside Xano, and then we'll go through a couple of demos just so you can see some of them in action. Now, just a little disclaimer before we get started, I am not a security expert. Please make sure to do your own research before executing any of these demos that you see in this video. This is for education purposes only, just to show you how to get to them and use them in Xano. Why would you need to encrypt and decrypt data inside of Xano? Well, first of all, you may just want an extra layer of protection if you are storing sensitive user data, uh, such as payment details. While you still have a responsibility as the owner or maintainer of that application's database to keep that data safe, and yes, you will still have the ability to decrypt it, it is still very good to just have that type of data encrypted inside the database so that it's not readily visible. You have to work to see that again. Another reason you might need to use encryption or decryption in Xano is some external APIs require you to send a username and password and have that encoded on the way out. Another use case that one of our customers approached us with recently is chat messages. They are building a real-time chat inside of their application, and they want those messages to be encrypted so that they cannot be seen when looking at the database view. While there are going to be countless reasons why you may need to use these inside Xano, and I'd actually love to hear about them, so please leave a comment down below. This video is just to show you where they are, how to get to them, and how to use them. So here we are in Xano. I have a very simple example set up to show you how encryption and decryption works. First, let's talk about where to actually find these functions and filters. So for the functions, you'll just click the plus sign in your function stack, and you can see we have a whole category dedicated to security. Most of them are pretty self-explanatory just based on the name, uh, like generate and validate passwords, JWE and JWS encode, and just general encryption and decryption as well. So we have these functions available to us, but we also have filters. So let's actually just go to add filter here. And if you tab over just a couple of steps, you see we have security. And again, we have a lot of these same functions are also available as filters, just to make sure you have as many options as possible when building your function stack. And then you get some more detailed descriptions in here as well. So we have several different encryption methods available here, JWE and JWS. Uh, we have MD5, which is normally used for verifying file integrity. Yeah, all sorts of different options in here. For the first little demo that we're going to go through, we're just going to do a basic encryption and decryption of a singular value. So let me walk you through my function stack. I have an encryption. I have an encrypt function here. The phrase that I want to encrypt, it just says encrypt this please. Now you have various algorithms that you can choose from. I'm just leaving it as defaults for now. You will also need a key and an initialization vector to encrypt and decrypt this data. Now, where do we get the key from? Let's talk about that first. Well. We have another function inside Xano called create secret key. That's really useful for this. So again, just one step. You can change the length of the key as well as the format for the key. You can return it as an object or as a base 64. Let's go ahead and run this just so you can see what it looks like. There's our key. Simple as that. As you generate these, you're going to want to store them somewhere. Storing these in environment variables is a really good option here. So I have our key that we generated earlier, and now I need an initialization vector. What is an initialization vector? I'm not gonna get super in depth into that, it's pretty technical, but I'll leave a resource down in the description below if you want to learn more about that. It's essentially another value that helps promote randomness when encrypting the data. The only other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take this encrypted value, let me just show you what this looks like first. So here is our encrypted value. You can see it's a little bit of a mess, mainly because we have some special characters in here that can make this pretty difficult to work with. So let's actually encode this in a way that makes it a little bit more friendly to work with. This is something that's recommended to be doing, especially if you're passing these values through a URL. You're going to need to encode those so that they actually arrive in the way that you expect. 
because URLs have different rules for special characters, it's good to encode them in a more friendly format. So we're creating a variable here. We're taking the result of that encryption and we're using a filter called base64 encode URL safe. So this gives us a much friendlier value to work with here. Let's take a look at that. So if we run this again, much easier to read. Not that we're reading it, but you understand. So that's great. So we've encrypted some data. It's safe from prying eyes, but what if we need to decrypt it? Well, let's talk about that. We also have a decrypt function and it's set up very similarly. We're giving it the data that we want to decrypt. So we're giving it this uh, variable one here and we are adding a base64 decode URL safe filter to this because we have it encoded in the previous step. We have the same algorithm, our same key, and our same initialization vector. Again, you can store these in environment variables to access them a lot easier. So let's take a look at the full end result. So I want to show my encrypted value. I'm going to return this as encrypted. And then we will add the decrypted to our response. And now let's run. So there we go. So we have our encrypted and our decrypted value. Pretty simple once you kind of understand how to configure these functions. So again, you have your data, you choose your algorithm, you generate a key. The create secret key function is really good for this. And then you need to specify an initialization vector. For decryption, you need that same key and that same initialization vector. Pretty straightforward. And this would immediately allow you to do things like encrypting sensitive user data in your database, such as payment details or chat messages, as we previously discussed. So let's talk about another use case. Let's talk about if you are calling a third party external API and they require some type of encryption on either the headers or the parameters as that data is sent to them. Let's see what that might look like. So I'm going to give you a little tour here. I'm going to go to my database first. I'm going to show you what I have going on here. I have products, just a couple of sample products in here. I have users and I have tokens. What I've essentially set up here is a really overcomplicated roundabout way to set up my own external API that requires these security filters to be used in the call. I want to be clear, there's much easier ways to do this with just normal authentication. You'll kind of see that as we go along here, but this is just for demonstration purposes to show you the security filters and functions. So this is really the table that I want to focus on here. We have both of our users. They both have different tokens and they have different permissions. Now you can see Chris has access to products and Sean doesn't have access to anything. It's going to be important to remember that. Now let's go to our API. And let's take a look at a couple of these here. So let's first take a look at the products, Git products, right? Usually very standard, just querying and you're done. Not this time. This time it's a little bit different. So what we're doing here is we are taking that token. That token actually contains some user data that will help us in the rest of the function stack to determine whether or not this user has access to products. Again, very simple with normal authentication. We're getting a little complicated here to show you how these filters and functions can work. First, I want to show you how we're generating those tokens. So we are taking a user ID. We're getting that record and then we're creating a variable. We are using the sprintf filter to construct a variable with their name and a colon and their email. And then we're using JWS encode to encode that into a token. And we can look in this filter quickly. It's not very complicated to set up. We have the filter chosen here. We don't have any headers included. We have our key stored in our environment variables. And then we chose our algorithm. The TTL is so you can specify how long the token is valid for. So if you don't want something that's valid forever, you want to make sure to specify something here. And let me just show you what this looks like. Let's go ahead and run this with a user. So there is our encrypted value. So now let's take a look at the Git products API. We are taking in that token that's generated in the previous step. What are we doing with that token? 
The first thing we have to do is decrypt it. We have to get the information that's inside of that. So we're using JWS decode. We're providing the same decryption key that's stored in our environment variables. And then we're using a split filter because remember we have our name, a colon, and the email. We're splitting those in two. Now let's see what this looks like in action. Let's go ahead and add a stop and debug function here. By the way, if you're not familiar with stop and debug, it's a really great tool to sort of step-by-step -step execute your function stack for troubleshooting purposes or just for demonstration like we're doing here. So I'm going to stop and debug and I'm going to show the value of this auth decrypt variable. Now let's go get one of our tokens. And then we'll go back and let's run this and let's paste our token. So you can see we have Chris and Chris at email.com. And again, our token looks like this. We are decrypting that value and then we're splitting it into an array to get that name and the email. Now, because that's in an array, we're doing some transformation here to separate the name and the email so we can actually query the user's table. And then we're just getting the record from the user table and we are checking the tokens table to see if that user has a token. If the user has a token and that token contains permissions for the products table, then we are finally querying the products table. If we don't have permission, we're still creating that products variable, but instead we're just putting in a message that says not authorized. So we're doing our own kind of error handling here. So taking a look at the differences between those, let's go ahead and run this with our token. And because we have permission to see these products, we can run this and we get product records, right? But let's go back to our table and let's get Sean's token. And let's run this again. You can see it says not authorized because Sean does not have permission to view the products. So, so far we've gone over a couple of different ways to encrypt and decrypt data. And in the last demo, I showed you how to use JWS tokens to essentially build your own user authentication from scratch is essentially what we're doing here. But now let's talk about actually calling that API externally. If you're working with external APIs, it's pretty likely that you're going to run into a situation where you have to call an external API and encode or encrypt some of that data that you're sending to the API. So in this example, we have a very similar endpoint to the Git products that we looked at earlier. However, in this case, we're taking advantage of the HTTP headers environment variable. What that does is it stores the headers of the external API request so you can continue to work with them in the function stack. The authorization lives in the header of those API requests. So if I was going to call this API externally, I need to pull that authorization token out of the headers and then proceed to decrypt it, get the name and email, check if they have permissions, and proceed from there. We're storing those headers in a new variable, and then we are decrypting that authorization token that we send to this API, just like before, and then we're splitting it so we get the name and the email, just like before, and then everything else is the same. We're checking for permissions, and we are querying the products, or we are returning a not authorized. So I'm not going to run and debug here. Now I'm going to uh, call this API via an external API request. You can see I have my Xano URL in here. In our headers, we're providing the authorization. So for this endpoint, I'm just going to give a name and an email instead. I'm not going to give a token. This is more to simulate a user logging in from your front end. I'm using sprintf to take the name and the email smash it together with the colon in between. And then I'm using my same key that's stored in my environment variables to encode that. And then I'm just sending that through the API request. So let's go ahead and run this. And you can see we have Chris and Chris at email.com. So when we run this, we should see a list of products just like before. But the difference is we are calling this API externally. So you can see there's our products. And let's take a look at the header here. You can see there's my authorization token. So now let's say I'm Sean and I want to get a list of products. Well, what happens? So if we change this to Sean and then Sean at email.com, remember Sean does not have permission. So if we run this, we get our not authorized. And again, here's our authorization token. 
So the way that we had this set up was pretty verbose. Let's take a look at a slightly more real world example in this silly little demo that we have going on. So I have a new API request here. It looks more complicated, but this is more to show you what you might be doing if you're calling an external API that requires this type of authentication. Uh, you probably wouldn't be providing a name and an email for that directly, or you would be providing that in the headers itself as a hard encoded value and then encoding that or encrypting that in some way. So what I have going on here is we're doing essentially the same thing, but we're building this JWS encode directly into the API request. So I'm taking my authorization, I have a percent %s, and then we're using the sprintf filter to fill in that percent %s with another percent %s with a colon and then percent %s, and then another sprintf filter to replace these two with the name and the email, and then we are using JWS encode with our key to encode that into an authorization token. Why are we doing this this way? Because when we're encoding this, we don't want to encode the word authorization. We just want to encode what's after that. That's why we have to stack these filters a little bit to get it to do what we want. So let's go ahead and run this again. We'll go ahead and use Sean as the example. And we scroll down again, not authorized right there, just like we expect. And there is our authorization token. Some external APIs will require you to use something more simple like a base64 encode or something like that. So let's take a look at what that would look like. So let's just have an example here. It says myapi.com. Let's go ahead and push a, uh, an authorization here. And let's do a percent %s because again, you probably don't want to encode that authorization text. Each API is going to be different, so definitely make sure to check their documentation. Let's add a filter, sprintf, and our argument is going to be here. Here is my key. And then we'll just add a filter, and we'll do a base64 encode. Very simple. This is a pretty standard example. If you're working with external APIs, you will most likely have to do this at some point. So before we wrap up, I do want to show you a couple more of these functions that you may find useful. Uh, this first one being create authentication token. Now, if you're familiar with authentication in Xano, once a user types in their name and password, an authentication token is generated to keep, their, to keep them logged in. That token is passed to your front end, and your front end hangs on to that and passes it back to Xano whenever that user makes an authenticated request. So this one is very simple. We're specifying our users table. We're specifying the user ID, which is probably coming from an input or something like that. We can also add extras to this token. The extras are for things like user roles. So if you have different users that can access different data, you can store their role inside the extras to call that along with the token. And then you also have an expiration in seconds. We also have a password generator. So let's take a look at that. You can set any requirements that you want for this generated password. This may be useful if your signup flow is a little bit non-standard and let's say you are sending passwords to users or something like that. You can use this to generate that and send it. We also have a random number generator. Let's take a quick look at that. Very simple, minimum and maximum, it gives you a random number. Okay, so I know that was a lot and we didn't even cover every single function and filter related to security and cryptography that's available in Xano. What you use here is going to be very specific to your use case. So definitely make sure to leave us a comment down below. If you have any questions, you can also reach out to us via support chat inside Xano or on the Xano community. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you in the next one.